presenter is Thomas Cardoza. Uh, Tom is Senior Honors Faculty Fellow at Arizona State University. He received his PhD from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, he too is the author of a wide variety of publications of many sorts, and again, I will focus in on his, um, his published book uh, that is entitled Intrepid Women, Cantinière and Vivandière of the French, of, of the French Army, 20, uh, which was published in 2010. And he has two books in progress, Female Soldiers in the Age of Revolution and a document collection, it sounds like, called Napoleon in Russia. And once this gets set up, Tom will be reading his paper. And this time, let me tell you the title. J'ai vu la cantinière, popular representations of military women oh, in French theater, my... art, and song. I need to get my, my thumb down. Uh, Montréal. Uh, I can probably take it from here, yeah. Thanks so much. Thanks. <laughs> All right, thanks for that intro. Uh, and my son is going to Rutgers right now, so go Rutgers. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's bringing me a Rutgers hat to keep me warm. All right. Pardon me, I'm just setting the stopwatch because I know I will probably not be paying attention to anything else other than history <laughs> while this is going. All right, in uh, 1890, the French War Ministry took a significant step in the suppression of the Army's uniformed military auxiliaries, uh, cantinières. Uh, it limited their, limited, eliminated their uniforms, replacing them with a simple arm plaque. Official records are sparse, but the debate over the true nature of Contignere played out in another much larger arena, which was French popular culture. In songs, advertisements, plays, arts, books, periodicals, two contested images of the Contignere struggled for primacy. One that showed her as an outdated and malignant figure, sapping French men and the French army of their vitality and morality, thus facilitating German victory. And another that saw her as a virtuous and vital traditional figure one that embodied France itself. By 1906, the first image seemed to have the upper hand officially, but the positive image was strongest in popular culture, and the Contignere emerged as a somewhat ahistorical, idealized figure of patriotic femininity, honesty, and good taste, though not necessarily a military one. Contignere were female auxiliaries of the French army who were married to soldiers. Since 1793, they owned, under their own names and not their husbands, the right to sell food, drink, and various sundries such as tobacco and writing paper to the soldiers of the regiments. From about 1830 until 1890, they wore official-looking uniforms modeled on the male uniforms of their regiments, with certain feminine fashion touches such as short skirts over bloomers uh, and earrings and that sort of thing. During the years of the Second Empire, the French government incorporated cantinières into the renascent Napoleonic legend, doubling their numbers and allowing their costumes to become increasingly elaborate. They began to appear in advertisements, as well as a series of popular images d'épinal lithographs and various songs, plays, comics, and stories. I'll just flip a few of these at you while we talk. <laughs> Contignere served with distinction in all the uh, wars of the Second Empire, winning numerous medals for bravery in combat. However, the French defeat of 1870 to 71 cast Contignere in a negative light for some. A uniquely French institution by this time, Contignere's absence from the Prussian and allied armies seemed an obvious point of difference that could help explain the effeminacy of the French army and thus its defeat at the hands of the more manly Germans. Over the next two decades, there was a steady drumbeat of arguments against the continued presence of Contignere and a slow but steady erosion of their numbers and status culminating in the suppression of their uniform in 1890, and the subsequent banning of their sale of alcohol in 1900, and their complete suppression in 1906 in favor of male Contigné. The moment that the public most noticed, though, was the suppression of the uniform, symbol of the Contigné's status as a militaire and not simply as an ouvrière. When the Contigné passed from her uniform to civilian clothes, one old veteran wrote, that picturesque uniform was so valiantly and so dearly honored. The French Contigné deserved better 
than the gray and lusterless garb of a housewife. The public saw this moment of defrocking far more than the actual moment of suppression as an epic changing event, something to notice, to lament, or to cheer. While attitudes varied, there were significant elements that both lauded the Contignere as a hero of the patrie and wanted to see her eliminated as an institution all the same. Now, one of the most interesting mass periodicals of fin de siècle France, and one targeted directly at the demographic most likely to have strong opinions about Contignere, was Bibi Tapin, published weekly in Paris with an annual subscription price of five francs. It was a patriotic, revanchist political journal masquerading as a humor magazine, aimed squarely at those who had served or who had otherwise had a strong interest in military life. With the suppression of the Contignere's uniform, the editors of Bibi Tapin hurriedly, hurriedly came up with enough material to release a dubious special issue titled Les Contignères Françaises, dedicated to the valiant Contignères of France. There was a brief and almost totally inaccurate history of Contignères, <laughs> while the editors admitted that uh, it was difficult to organize serious documents and ended the piece with, who knows? <laughs> One wonders where they did find their evidence. They claimed that no other army had ever had uniform vivandières attached to regiments, that it was Lazare Carnot as the organizer of victory who had allowed Mayo Contigné to marry, uh, but that they were known somehow as Cambusier at the time. None of this, of course, is true. Moreover, it significantly distorts the real role of Contigné. Carnot neither authorized Contigné marriages nor did so in terms of males. The law of April 20th, 1793, passed by the National Convention, authorized a woman who was already married to a soldier to apply in her own name for a license to be a vivandière or contignère. This meant that she, not her husband, owned the license, and thus the business itself. Bibi Tapin's version placed contignère squarely within the standard French civilian legal system in which the husband owned all property. French military law placed contignère outside that system as independent property owners. Thus, in glorifying the, quote, valiant contignère, Bibi Tapin subtly degraded her and brought her down from her true legal status. And it did this, through this throughout the special issue. In reality, a contignère was a contignère, not a cambusière, in her own right, not because she married her husband. There were many other tales about contignère in the issue, some of them true, but I will save the closing story, so clearly allegorical, for the end of the talk. The contignère had other critics. The high command and some members of the public saw her as an agent of demoralization and decay in the French army. As the provider of alcohol, she was a prime target for reform movements, particularly after universal conscription became more or less a reality in 1889, and attempts to suppress Contignere increased dramatically from 1890 onwards. Both the view of the Contignere as a tempstress and as a promoter of alcoholism had their supporters, though they seem to have been in the minority, and there is little public record of these views before the War Ministry forbade Contignere to sell alcohol in 1890, excuse me, in 1900. To protect the troops from the danger of alcoholism, as the uh, regulation put it. It is worth noting that General Galifet argued that French soldiers needed protection from the Contignere. In other words, it was women peddling alcohol who were the problem, not the soldiers drinking it. Let's look at a, who knows, right? <laughs> Let's look at a few images from the period that illustrate the twin problems of Contignere's sexuality and their positions as sellers of alcohol. Noting that they all appeared after the ministry's decision to suppress uh, Contignere alcohol sales, and in most cases after the ministry suppressed Contignere altogether in 1905. One immediate reaction to the suppression of alcohol sales came from La Dépêche. It ran a cover illustration with a picture of a cow as the regimental canteen. And the caption, the Minister of War, having suppressed the sale of alcohol in the barracks, why not replace the Contignères henceforth with cows, with all due respect? <laughs> now we have to ask ourselves, was this a light-hearted poke at military puritanism? Or was it a suggestion that Contignères had no function other than his dispensers of alcohol? Certainly the image implies both concepts, and the second is not particularly flattering to Contignère. Moreover, by moving the Contignère to the rear of the regiment, not the front where she normally rode, and by emphasizing the cow's rear end and udders, the cartoon represents a decidedly unflattering image of these military women. Moving on with the breast fixation, um, this postcard uh, postmarked 10 uh, May 1906 is well worth closer analysis. The Contignere, first of all, is massive. She towers over the two tiny soldiers and the bottles are clearly extensions of her breasts. The 
Soldiers are fat and helpless, looking up to the cantonier greedily. Thus, everything about this image infantilizes soldiers, and the cantonier is the agent of the infantilization process. Moreover, the boys each have an empty wine-stained glass in front of them, showing they were capable of drinking on their own, but also to suggesting they've already had the drink they came into the canteen for, like good boys, um, and that the cantonier is literally forcing more alcohol on them. It shows an extremely negative view of cantonier as agents of sexual perversion, alcoholism, and the weakening of the nation's defenders. And there are more interesting things going on in the background, but we'll leave this one for now. Likewise, this 1909 postcard represented a highly sexualized and negative image of Contignier from the era of the Directory. Clearly a reference to the 1799 incident that Jean Roche Coignet described in his memoirs, uh, Les Carriers du Capitaine Coignet. Uh, it depicts a group of cantiniers parading a cantinier, uh, sorry, a group of soldiers. Boy, it is early for me, isn't it? It depicts a group of soldiers uh, parading a cantinier nude on her donkey. I think you can see that, so thank you for the obvious description, Tom. In Coignet's description of the event, the woman had received stolen silverware from some soldiers, and her commander ordered her punished. Again, the soldiers who committed the crime were not the problem. The woman who received the stolen goods, perhaps unknowingly, was. Moreover, the image is quite disturbing. Several soldiers leer at her, one touches her buttocks, while another strokes her hair and pinches her ear. They lean forward menacingly, while she leans away in fear. In short, we have a scene of male power and female powerlessness, of fully clothed men dominating a helpless and naked woman. The fact that the cantinier rides side saddle, contrary to all historical and practical evidence, merely confirms her uselessness in a military setting. This is, in fact, men taking control from women in an era where women are threatening to take control away from men. Popular songs also created the image of the cantinier as a mere sex object, with no military value. For example, this one from 1908, Le Mont de la Cantinière, was about a soldier who slept with a married cantinier. Part of a series of, quote, light-hearted comic songs for men, it created a male fantasy of military service that involved shirking one's duty, having sex with a married woman, uh, cuckolding the sergeant, and laughing about it. A typical day in the barracks. While the song's audience is men, one could argue that its purpose is to make military service less, seem less onerous. There is no mistaking the cantinier's subversive role. She's married to a senior NCO, but sleeps with a young soldier, undermining military hierarchy and marriage itself. To have him handy, she makes him her garçon de cantine and gets him out of, quote, all the work details, thus subverting military discipline and undermining the theoretical equality of all draftees under the two-year law. The language of the song is salacious as well, with the first uh, stanzas having the two of them exchanging words of love, but continuing, elle me dit et me fait autre chose aussi que je ne peux pas vous dire ici. Um, not sure what that means. <laughs> Finally, the song ends with a very suggestive verse in which the soldier washes her cat, then, quote, bravely descends into her cave where he gets out his broom and makes sure everything is well cleaned. The final refrain mentions that it's best if her husband doesn't know about this because, quote, it might make him upset. Et je vous déclare que je suis foutu s'il apprend que je le fais coucou. Such songs portrayed the cantinier as a subversive force inside the military and in French society as a whole. Yet for all this negativity, the overwhelming majority of unofficial imagery of cantinier was positive. In need of some sort of spiritual renewal on a grueling hot day in July 1898, Poitevin conservative Jean Duc made two pilgrimages, one to a religious shrine and another, somewhat, somewhat religious, to see the 137th Infantry Regiment march into Poitou. He wrote, J'ai vu les drapeaux, j'ai vu les commandants à cheval, j'ai vu la cantinière. While the cantinière was only part of the, quote, noisy and military spectacle that revived his sagging spirits under the evil republic, she was an important part and one worth mentioning, even eight years after she lost her uniform. Perhaps this was why the advertisers continued to use cantinière as symbols and even as brand names throughout the 19th and 20th centuries suggesting that where it counted most, profits and brand image, major companies believed that the public perception of Contenier was not just positive. Contenier personified good taste, honesty, and attention to a quality product. Again, very domestic, not military. Black and company used Contenier as a brand name for its chicory coffee substitute. 
And despite the inaccuracy of uh, illustrations, uh, the women are wearing skirts that are much too long. They do not have pants on. They're riding side saddle, which is ridiculous in combat. Uh, it helped to popularize the link between cantinier and good quality through a series of cantinier trading cards such as these with various advertisements on the back side. One of the most common ad texts read, La chicorée black à la cantinière française coûte cher, mais c'est la plus économique car il en faut moitié moins que d'autres. The association of Contigny with high prices as well as quality and value is telling and perhaps presents a better image of popular views than did official regulations. Contigny may have charged high prices, but they were worth it. And in the end, the Cantine was a better deal than the bars and cabarets in town. Certainly, Black and company believed that images of Contigny associated with their products justified a higher price in the public mind. And since it claimed it was selling 20 million packets of Chicorée La Contigny, Chicorée La Contigny annually, quite a few people must have agreed. A rival company even tried to capitalize on the older name Vivandière, while other companies used the same, the name or image of Contigny to sell everything from chocolate to foot powder. And uh, many of these companies are still around. Moreover, the Contigny vogue in advertising died down only slowly. In 1933, Bloch et Compagnie was still selling the Contigny brand chicory, and it even reimagined the Contigny as a virginal bride, part of the perfect union. And while most advertisers did not go so far, Dubonnet was still using the Contigny to sell its liquor in 1938, very ahistorically, but very successfully. While Bouvard, now Group Danon, used a very historically inaccurate Napoleonic Contignere to sell its pasta during the early 1960s. And again, we can see the male is standing proud and erect, um, looking on as the female kneels down uh, at his feet, literally, and cooks the pasta in this great big... You couldn't really cook pasta like that, could you? <laughs> sort of keep... yeah. we'll, uh, we'll call in someone else to do the, uh, the, the deep analysis here. <laughs> and uh, again, back in Poitou, uh, we had uh, this uh, cooperative selling its uh, brand name cheese, uh, Belle Contignere, uh, into the 1980s. Even the French government got into the act as late as 1940, using a stylized and updated Contignere in ads to promote fundraising for World War II, the uh, Loterie Nationale. But the most compelling item is a co postcard that a young soldier sent to his family in 1929, compelling to me at least. It shows a group of recruits far too young to remember real cantinier, solemnly toasting in the now male-owned and male-operated canteen. Vive la classe et à la santé de nos pays et de la cantinière. Wishful thinking perhaps, but apparently widespread. Finally, to return to Bibi Tapin. Oh, we lost the image, that's okay. The special issue on Contignere ended with an apocryphal story that neatly reconciled the conflicting public views on Contignere, acknowledging their bravery but subtly painting them as relics of the past that needed to go. The story, L'Ancien Contignere, Episode de l'Année Terrible, uh, shows France still holding out against the German hordes. And I do mean hordes, they're, they're everywhere. We don't know precisely when this event occurred, but according to the story, quote, Paris and Belfort still resisted, and the little village of F, where I live, had not yet been soiled by the Germans. Though the village remained free, tucked away in its forested mountains somewhere, word came that a squadron of Uhlans was advancing towards it. The mayor called the men to arms and was astonished to see Madame Bourgeois, perfect name, a widowed former cantinier among them. She insisted that she had been at the siege of Sevastopol and that she understood war. J'ai fou tout ça, she says. The battle that followed was furious, and as always in Bibi Tapin tales of 1870, it was, quote, a fight of one against 30. For four hours, the villagers fought against the ferocious Uhlans, encouraged by the mayor and by the cantinière. The Germans had to retreat, of course, but afterwards, many villagers did not respond to the roll call, including Madame Bourgeois. Her face horribly mutilated, the story tells us, her chest pierced with more than 20 lance thrusts. They found her still holding a scrap of the tricolor flag in her rigid fingers. And the brave mayor, laying his hand on the corpse, pronounced in a voice cut short by sobs these simple words, give honor to Madame Bourgeois. She died for France. The special issue ended on that note. 
It did not discuss the Contignere service from 1870 to 1890, glossing over two decades of activity at home and overseas. It did not discuss the women who won military medals for long-term meritorious service in peacetime, nor did it even mention the reasons why it might be necessary to eliminate their uniforms and perhaps to eliminate Contignere altogether. Rather, it acknowledged that this old woman, widowed and without husband, children, or occupation to justify her existence, had behaved bravely in one last fight, but that she had given her life for France. So it had to be. Mutilated, pierced symbolically 20 times by lances, she was the embodiment of selfless sacrifice, but also the perfect illustration of Teutonic savagery and cruelty. If this was what the Germans could do to a respected old woman, then future generations must do everything possible to stop them, and indeed to push them back. Moreover, the Contignere had to die. Just as French officers who wanted to eliminate women pointed out that, quote, the German army did not have Contignere in 1870, Bibi Tapin implied that the Contignere was old, worn out, widowed, and her combat experience dated to 1855. She might be brave, and she might have helped to keep morale up, but in the end, she had died for France. And that was an outcome that the nation should honor, not mourn. This did not prevent the French from looking back on the Contignere with nostalgia and longing. Indeed, she remained associated with the years of France's greatest victories. The decision to, to suppress these women, while it had some support among the people and certainly among the journalists, represented the views of the Supreme War Council and the Ministry of War, not of France as a whole, which continued for the most part to wish it could still say, J'ai vu la Contignere. Thank you.